This is Joe back with another episode of the Level Up Your Gym podcast, and this is going to be a weird one, so we're going to get right into it. I am joined by Michael. Now, Michael came over to visit our gym, Synergy, around 2013 and wrote a very kind blog post about it, and huge credit to him coming over to the States. He's from the UK, made time to stop by the gym to talk shop, talk uh, talk exercise. At that time, we were mostly helping trainers with their exercise programs before we shifted over to the gym mentorship, which we're providing now. And from when I started posting these videos, he stumbled across one on YouTube and said, hey, it's been seven years. Um, remember me? And absolutely, it's not every day I get someone flying over from England to visit. So I certainly remember Michael and I said, why don't we jump on a podcast and you can ask any, me any questions you have about the business and industry and as you continue to grow, Michael, and I'll answer them for you. And this is the teacher in me. If you have those questions, chances are a lot of other people will have those questions. So hopefully we can help a lot of people out. And while we get to catch up, how are things with you? Good, good. Kind of getting by, adjusting, make, making good of, of whatever's available in the UK at the minute. We're sort of on a, a second lockdown. So we're okay doing outdoor exercise, but gyms and everything else are shut down for a while now. Yeah, it's, it's been a roller coaster, but I think in the big picture, this will be more of a blip on the radar so we can continue to focus yeah. on long-term growth. So uh, number one, I really appreciate you doing this. I know the time zones are wildly different and you're a busy man and to have the opportunity to speak to someone that's been so long. Um, so where, what have you been up to the last seven years and what can I help so, you with today? So I've, I've, I have been working in a couple of gym facilities, renting space in the gym. Uh, and my wife also is a trainer. Uh, she did similar for the last, well, over 10 years or so now. Uh, since the lockdown happened and what we're kind of thinking about before, we've been looking at the reality of renting a space ourselves, uh, what that would mean, how it would look with some COVID restrictions and, and what would happen. And, and what I remembered, and I was, I've told her a lot about your facility that I visited before. And how I really liked it. And I kind of wanted to pick your brain so I could give her more information about what I saw and how it works. So that, was, that was my first question, if you like, was what there are lots of business models available. And I think when I came in before I came in on my own and trained, and then you also had some small group stuff going on. And where I've, I worked once for a place in Australia and they were doing small group stuff, but everyone had their own programs with some people working on their own. I kind of wanted to ask what is the business model you use and is it the same in all of the facilities that you have or is it, does it vary place on place? Great question. Our model is a little unique and I'll, I'll explain that, but also put some caveats on what I would start now if I were to possibly open now with the restrictions and everything with COVID. But our model in a nutshell is that we're open blocks of time. We're open from six to 10 in the morning and three to seven in the evening. So we have four hour blocks. Our members can come in any hour. Now this is pre COVID, uh, come in any hour within that time frame, and they'll be guided through their own personal workout by a trainer. And it happens to work out that, you know, well, each trainer will help out 10, 11 people. It's a different model than starting everyone at the same time. I like the flexibility of kind of a rolling start. So you have some people finishing up, some people coming in. So it's not like a group feel. So they feel like they're just getting the same as everyone else. Yeah. It's a totally unique personal approach and love that for two main reasons. Number one, we're able to be incredibly flexible with our scheduling. Back when we met in 2013, I was all about the sets and reps and exercise part, which is a huge portion of it. You got to check that box. Mm. But I didn't have the experience yet to understand how crazy the lives of an average person is. Yeah. And we were dealing with, when, you know, when we got up to 100, 200, 300 clients and continued to grow far, far after that as we opened more locations, we were dealing with a lot of customer service. Hey, can I switch my schedule? Can I come in then? Can I come? The answer was always yes. So why were we putting that barrier up for them? and having to do a lot of office work with rescheduling people and moving them all about. So we did flexible scheduling. You come in, we'll guide you through a personal workout. Each trainer ha handled, you know, eight to 12 people, depending on how new they were, both the trainer and the client. So clients that had been for, with us a while, needed less form coaching, just kind of needed the sets, reps, chop busting, the usual. And um, the newer people need a lot more attention. So there's a lot of flexibility in that model, but that's, that's the basic approach. But now during COVID times, we've switched where people have to schedule on the hour and they come in 45 minutes. We still guide them through their own workout. 
so, <laughs> so as much as I love our model, my caveat for now is it's a lot of space dependent. So if you have real tight space, you're going to have to go with the smaller group training model at a higher yeah, price yeah. point because of capacity restrictions. Is and that, with the, with following their workout, is it, is it, everyone has their own unique stuff or is there like a, a theme for the day or the week or whatever? Or is it, is it, is it day on day or is, do they have something they're following for 12 weeks, eight weeks or something? Everyone has their own unique program. Cool. Uh, we've done eight week templates. We've done 12 week, we've done whiteboarding and there's too many restrictions to all those programs. Number one, to get people into it. So if you're on week six of a 12 week mm -hmm. program, are you going to take new members when people are like, Hey, I want to start now. Well, now you have to jump them in at week six. What's yeah, the yeah. point of doing the progressions if you're throwing them in the middle of it? So we have to have a rolling start model. We teach our trainers a very basic um, uh, protocol. We do upper lower splits mostly. So upper body day, you start from biggest muscle groups, you move to smallest. It might be push, pull, shoulders, weakness, weakness, arm muscle. And so the trainer knows whomever they see in front of them are going to get that type of programming you'll start from the biggest muscles for an adult it might be a medicine ball wall pass for 30 seconds for an athlete it might be a, a their bench press numbers that's their their chest exercise the back exercise might be a trx row for someone might be a dumbbell row might be a band pull apart it totally depends on the person in front of them and the expertise of the trainer gets to choose what's appropriate within that framework that we give them cool uh, the next question I had was from what, before you had any facility and what you imagined it was going to be like, and then the reality of when you did have your first facility, what was the biggest surprise between what you dreamt of and the reality? And then within that question, has there been, the, what's been the biggest kind of pivot point where you thought your business was going direction A and for whatever reason that it's not what you had in your brain and what you imagined and you've veered off to a new, in a new direction. Yeah. So for those watching on YouTube, I know a lot of people will be listening to this on Spotify or iTunes. Michael's standing in, it looks like a garage gym that is twice the size of what I started in. So from okay. what you can see in Michael's camera, where he can almost touch all four walls from standing in the middle of it. That's probably bigger than what we started. And we started in our garage basement too. Okay. And uh, we started with athletes and then we rented a spot behind a baseball development facility. So it was cheap for athletes. And here's the thing that that um, I guess the biggest pivot point that, that came is that athletes are seasonal and a lot of them are getting pulled into their school programs, which is good. They should work out as a team and uh, local orthopedics started giving trainers for free and they're working out for, for the athletes as a group. And it was, it was getting tough to market to large groups of athletes. So what we want to keep, the athletes that wanted that specialty training, and we still have a lot of them, but we needed to pivot to something that was a bigger model for growth, which included parents, which we soon learned were more like just adult athletes. A lot of them were former athletes, and uh, we weren't sure about, about it, but we just sent an email out to our athletes' parents said, hey, we're going to try this for 30 days. Who wants to start? And we had 60 people start, and it was some of the most amazing people, and I didn't, and I, I wasn't sure if I'd like adult training, but... Um, really grew to it really loved it and that's kind of our primary focus now so completely pivoted and now we'll have our actually probably have the similar number of athletes it's been um pretty steady but the adults are what has allowed us to grow the facilities add the staff and even serve the athletes at a higher level because now we can afford a lot more so um a lot more investment in those programs too so we had to get to something that was a more sustainable model without the seasonality of athletes. So we yeah. pivoted and added adults. Okay. What do you think is the biggest pitfall for someone setting out if they were following in your footsteps and what's been, the, what's the biggest uh, hidden danger, if you like, for someone kind of doing this, doing something similar? I do like, I do like that question. Cause I, I made a bunch of mistakes. So choosing the biggest one might be tough. Maybe I'll give you a couple. Uh, the first one I alluded at earlier, you need to check the boxes of being a good trainer. I spent a lot of time obsessing over the sets and reps and I love that stuff, but it doesn't mean the average client of yours should love it as much as you do. And that's what uh, got me out of doing online selling manuals and doing a lot of the, a lot of the online trainings. I found myself talking to other trainers and coaches and then that would carry over. I was talking to my clients kind of in the same way. 
um, excited about all this stuff on what I was learning about the physiology and what we could do to help them. But really, they just wanted the end results. And I was selling them the airplane and not the destination. So my biggest <clears throat> pitfall was not speaking to the clients on their level for the first little bit. Now you get away with it with athletes, but you can't get away with it with adults because it puts them to sleep. So <clears throat> that was one of my biggest pitfalls, followed by investing in things before education. So you need to check the box of having a nice, clean facility and with some equipment. The general people don't know the difference between the most elite uh, new rogue bar or, you know, the, to, uh, the bar you can pick up at your local shop. But if you invest hundreds of dollars in all this equipment and you're not spending any time in mentorship with teaching people or really learning actually how to run the business and grow it, you're going to end up yeah. with a bunch of stuff. You're going to have to sell at a garage sale for cheap because no one even knows what it is. And so I would advise, check the box, get the, cleanliness of the facility get the minimum equipment you need and then spend the time on education whether it's as a trainer education or whether it's business education and making that pivot early on would be huge for someone who's just starting out okay from kind of what i see with the facilities and stuff that i keep an eye on in in the uk compared to the u.s the u.s it's a bit of a sweeping statement. It seems to be specialist a lot more. Everyone specializes. Everyone wants to be the, the number one guy of this or that or want to work with predominantly baseball players or what. Do you think there's room within the market for people to not be a specialist and take the people either doing nothing to a level of improving their general activity or take the people doing something and just adding guidance and education for those people so that they're, they're spending their time more wisely? Yeah, not only is there a huge market for it, it's probably the largest market. Mm. And this is one of, I guess, go back to the pitfall question. When you're getting into training, you're going to find people online and follow them. Like you found me when I was talking about training, or you'll find those people who talk about uh, elite athletic development or could be the trainer or are the trainer of someone famous. And you don't hear about the trainers who are training thousands of adults. And yeah. so from visiting the gyms, I found a lot of those people who you think are doing exceptionally well because they're online famous are not doing well in their businesses because they're, they're mm. almost losing revenue because they're so focused on just getting a few elite clients. They're trying to jump up and grab the highest hanging, hardest to reach fruit yeah. that their business, number one, it's seasonal with athletes, but number two, those, those people are often given discounts to train at those places. And number three, there's so few of them. It's not really sustainable for a business while it look, makes you look cool online. So the businesses that are exploding are like the you know, F45, Orange yeah. Theories, the ones that are, are generalists for adults that are spreading across the country. And you'll see a lot of those elite athlete development places. And I'm not going to name names, but you'll see a lot of those franchises starting to close and shrink down because they, uh, they were more internet famous than reality famous. So there's a huge, huge, huge market for just general people wanting to be able to wake up in the morning without pain, to be able to walk up a flight of stairs without breathing hard and to renew their energy and start feeling good like they did when they were kids. Yeah. That's my thing. Well, often when I've been working in the gym, I look around and think I would love to grab a cross section of people and just kind of level up their training. So they don't need one-to-one -one training and they're not a million miles away from what they could be doing, but they could get another 20% or 50% out of their hour in the gym and just need a little bit of guidance and a bit of structure to what they're doing. And then they're kind of good to go just take the training wheels off and let people run free after that. And just a, a steer in the right direction rather than an overhaul or a specialist in, in any, in any particular area. Yep. That makes sense. That's kind of, mm. so, and uh, so also your, your, before you get to your next question, your biggest market are probably people who are not already doing it independently. Mm. Like it's, it's tough because as a commercial, if you've been doing commercial gyms, like I think you mentioned you and your, your wife are doing a girlfriend. Did I screw that up? Wife. Okay. Whew, I don't want to, I don't want to make that announcement. It's the same person too. There's only one. There's not, there's not one. <laughs> the wife and girlfriend. Yeah. Which one, yeah. whichever one, uh, has the commercial gym experience. If they're showing up and going through the motions themselves, yeah, they can probably be doing it a little bit better. Uh, but it's that person who's like the commercial gym really isn't for me because I don't know what to do. I want to pay mm -hmm. someone to teach me how to do it. That's going to be the biggest market, but go ahead yeah. with your next question. Okay. So we, we kind of talked about uh, things you went and did and you mentioned about the certain expensive brands that you kind of think actually there's, then there's not going to get the return on investment, but what, 
in reality, when you first started out, did you try, did you spend money on that you shouldn't have, whether it's equipment or, or a specialist or whatever? And then on the flip side of that, what did you not spend money on trying to save money? Whereas in fact, you realize after a while that you should have kind of invested in somebody who's a, a marketing expert or uh, an out and out sales, but whatever it is, what, where did you cut corners that you shouldn't have? Yes. And where did you spend money that you shouldn't have? So I've always been a little on the cheap side. So the equipment thing didn't get me too bad. It got me with a few no. items that I more wanted for my own personal use. And I thought everyone would be excited for, and then they weren't. Uh, but I liked it anyway. So I didn't spend yeah. a ton of money on that, but marketing was a big one. I went first with traditional marketing. So we did a TV ad, uh, and this is probably 2010, way back about a decade ago where the, uh, Facebook ads, everything wasn't so prevalent or local magazines are prevalent now or, or even newspapers still a little bit kicking around. I spent probably, I don't know, $2,500, $3,000 more than I had spent almost all the equipment in my first gym on getting a TV ad. And I got like two people who were not a great fit at all call from the ad. And it was both my messaging and me thinking that I was ready for that and having no real call to action and having no real front end offer spent way too much money on traditional advertising before I had my business systems figured out. And it's weird. There's a good book called predictably irrational. Like when we spend money on that, we're like, yeah, it should cost 2,500, $3,000. Cause that's what a TV ad costs. Well, if I spent that same 2,500, $3,000 on getting a, a mentor at the time, which could probably get, you know, 199, 299 a month with a highly qualified gym expert. And again, I'm not just saying this because that's what I do at level up your gym. You're welcome to anyone's welcome to find any expert they want to follow. That's more in their niche. Um, but I wish I had spent that either learning more about the marketing side and clarifying our branding because later on I did spend $5,000 with a branding company out of Florida and it was money very well spent spent where we went through our brand messages and we did our website and we, we clarified everything and we went over what our staff should be saying to uh, every member, making sure everyone was talking the same language. It was a huge investment, but it was well worth it. So on one side, screwed up a similar investment. One side it worked is because I didn't know enough of what I wanted when I spent that money. And unless you know what you want, they're not going to be able to provide it for you. I know you saved money uh, making some equipment. I've got my own Bulgarian bags that I learned oh, yeah. by YouTube to make from you as well. And they, uh, yeah. still, they still work. I think we have to say, um, uh, what do we have to call them now? Uh, training, some sort of training bags. Those vid videos on how to make it got so popular. The, uh, that, that company, I don't want to say it, contacted me. Okay. We have to take them down because I guess there's a trademark on that kind of equipment. Okay, so curved, so curved training bags. Yeah, exactly. Like little C training bags. And so yeah. we had to go through or they threatened to sue us for, for having home gym equipment to try to protect their market share. Uh, um, but we just switched up. Surprised. The They're very durable. I've had mine a long time. They, they still work. I, I still have mine. It's been like 12 years. I love it. Yeah. Did you, so when you first set out and you went, you said you went from like a, a garage gym and you kind of scaled up. Did you, I think it's very different in the US. You have there are more facilities, more space available, but did you have any hurdles with landlords or, um, in securing places that's kind of we've been looking and we've kind of hit and clashed with a few not clashed we've hit a few hurdles with landlords who didn't want that kind of use of their facility they want to use it for storage or they want kind of low level traffic coming in not people coming and going and not anti-social hours there did you have anything similar or or and how did you overcome it if you did yeah that's, that's super common for landlords so if you're looking at more industrial space at the beginning it, it's going to be a little bit more challenged if you're looking at a lower price point, which I think you should at the beginning. Um, yeah. So you don't have as much overhead while you figure out all those business systems and you make all those pitfalls I talked about, make them faster and learn from them without getting buried by a high rent. Um, yeah. So you have to understand their perspective. If they could rent the space to nobody and have to deal with no liability of someone coming in and getting hurt and no cars going anywhere. So it's just not worth the hassle. So you have to be prepared to say, um, you know, what else can we do to make this space work? And what we did, we had similar situations with a few and just wasn't going to work out, which was fine. But we had someone who wanted us to train their kids and said, Hey, we need a little, little more space. Can you help us out? We'll pay you that rent. And so we ended up building a relationship with him uh, on the training side to help him and his family out. And then he helped us out on the, get to some space side, but it did take a while to go through a couple yeah. who have parking issues, who have different town ordinances, 
uh, around you industrial space versus commercial space and i don't know all the laws in the uk actually i don't know any of the laws in the uk you guys are a wild bunch over there um but yeah it sounds like similar hurdles hmm. that's what we, we found a couple that we were keen on and they they've gone for kind of people with yeah less less noisy tenants basically and then some that were keen on us but then we were we turned down because they were less suitable for things like parking and location and bits and pieces so we haven't jumped to anything but it, yeah, very sm- quite lined up just yet. Very smart not to push anything now because I like the slow and, and calculated approach, but now it's going to be more of a buyer's market when there are so much commercial space available due to pandemic issues mm-hmm. and landlords are going to look to fill it. And so, you know, maybe you can circle back if those places are still available, say, Hey, we're still looking for a place. I know, I know you were worried about noise, but it still hasn't worked out. Is there anything mm-hmm. that we can do? And uh, you, you, you might be able to find something in the next you know, handful of months. So my next two questions were kind of linked to, the, but to do with outreach. So one of them was, uh, I know you've done lots of stuff with communities and schools and bits and pieces. And on one of your other podcasts, you were talking about how you got involved with uh, meeting with uh, kids and parents of the kids and went in that way. What's been any other kind of successful routes into de- dealing with pre gym age people? Cause I think that's also another market of people before when I first was allowed to go into a gym, I signed up, but I don't think I probably was even given an induction. And I kind of went around and did some arm weights and just lay on the bench press and did everything. And then you end up with shoulder issues down the line. I played rugby and I had knee issues. And it's kind of like, I feel like there's that group of a couple of years where you're in a hotspot before you're allowed in the gym. Again, the whole training wheels idea that I'd like to work with those people before they go and do their own thing. And how did you go about getting involved with that age group? So we we're going to do this question and we've done, I have one that's not even out yet podcast on doing good in your community. Uh, I speak regularly on community joint ventures because mm-hmm. it is the most important thing we've done as a company in the last two years to smooth out the ups and downs of all the online marketing. And it feels good to do good in the community. A lot of people don't buy into it though, because they, have listened to the the marketing side of you should do nothing for free. You always have to charge at least a dollar and all that, which is probably true if you're only selling virtual products. And it is very, very not true. If you're doing selling a service, there are people want a proof of concept first, and then they can easily go in and sign up because we've proven it time and time again in the last two years. But to get to speak tactically, we volunteered at a lot of youth things. So if it's rugby, if there's a local rugby kid, ours was, was American football, the real football. No offense. With the pads. Uh, the one with the pads. <laughs> the one of the pads. The very well said. Uh, we'd say, hey, we know it's your season starting. Can we come in at the beginning of practice and help your kids warm up? And they're like, yeah, sure. So we got out, we warmed up all the kids, and they would let us send mm-hmm. an email to the parents saying, hey, you know, at, at the end of the season, but then your kids want to work out. We did the same for basketball. We did the same for girls softball. We just would go in and provide warm-ups and coaches got used to asking us and we'd go do it for completely for free. We'd go out to the town events and help the kids warm up and stretch because they're always volunteer coaches for the youth level and they just don't want to deal with a hassle. So we were taking a hassle off their plate, solving a problem for them. We also helped them with fundraisers. We said, hey, we'll bring our staff over. We'll do a speed and agility clinic for your team completely free. You guys can charge $5 if you want. Whatever you bring in, you just keep 100% of it as a charitable donation. So we'd go in and teach the kids. Uh, Sessions, we have sometimes 100. And recently, we did a hockey uh, club that had 120 kids just pre-COVID in our facility to do some speed and agility work. And then at the end of the season, we're able to send them an email and build that reputation uh, but you also need a program that speaks directly to their needs, not say, hey, come train with me. Yeah. Say, hey, do you want, uh, is your child looking to develop some more strength in a safe environment while building some work ethic and being more active? And that's what you're going to say to the parents. Um, now, also, we work with a lot of parents. We Now, when we run a kid's class, we just send an email out to our parents. We kind of do it the lazy way now that we have a reputation and don't have to do as much in person. We'll just send an email and say, hey, we're going to do an eight-week kids uh program here's what we're looking for who wants one of our 10 spots and they'll usually fill up but the groundwork of that being someone in your community makes a huge difference Hmm. and so leading on from that aside from the uh student age group i know you do a combination of outreach uh events and initiatives and, and whatever but what would you say has been your number one 
over the years your number one way of generating new members if you had to pick one i know you, i know the answer is more than one but what's the top of the list do you think yes so i i've pivoted a little bit we from probably 2014 2000 eh, probably 2015 till 2018 so about those three years we would grow and in like big waves and then slow down big waves we'd run a, a challenge or a program we'd add 50 new people and then you know through attrition or whatever we'd lose you know five or ten over the next year then we'd run another challenge it's kind of these big waves and maintenance mm -hmm. and i pivoted my thinking to focusing on continued growth through referrals and reactivations which aren't sexy so people don't like to talk about them but if you're you're adding um a you know, five, 10 buddies a month through referrals and reactivating three to five people a month, you really need to spend hardly anything else on marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, the other piece of it is the, the community side. The community side has led us to our largest growth where we will often try to solve the problems of someone who serves our target client. For example, uh, there's a, a indoor turf rental place. It's, there's just these fields indoors and the guy rents them out. So I said, Hey, you know, I know you have a lot of athletes and parents that come through here and right now it's down season because they really are busy in the winter, slow in the summer. So can I pay a hundred bucks to send an email out to your list? And he's like, yeah, sure. Or a hundred, hundred, 120 pound or whatever you guys, those little yeah, yeah. squiggly L's. Probably about a hundred pounds at the minute, but <laughs> it's like one for one. Used to be All right, well, there you go. So, um, you know, can, can I send an email out to all your parents? Now these are parents who are willing to pay for their kids to go to, um, indoor turf space and these travel teams and everything. So they have disposable income. They care about health and fitness. They're my target audience audience. And I can go to him and send out an email whenever I want. You know, we do the same with uh, employers of our ideal clients. We do the same with a lot of different businesses where we'll exchange something of value, whether it's, I just paid him a little bit of money for an email or we'll do some employee wellness videos for him. Or we'll do some lunch and learns for him. Um, but I guess the groundwork is really to know where in town. Well, first of all, identify the people that you want to serve, exact people you want to serve. And the second step is to figure, write down an actual list of places where those people will go. And then there's your list of people you need to build relationships with. Okay. And, and obviously leading on from that, one of the things is, I know you do a lot of things on YouTube, and free content and taking time to speak to people. What is your kind of thinking behind that? Is, is it to build a brand or are you, are you looking at a long-term kind of financial plan with it? Or what, what's the, what do you, what's, what, if I said to you, why do you do so much on YouTube? What would be your kind of reasoning? Cause obviously like we spoke about before, there are, there is the sort of Insta sham is that people like to call it that kind of <laughs> this life that people show and it does it ever bring money in or are people just doing it for their own, so they feel good about themselves and they go to bed at night you know like what's the what's the purpose yeah get the dopamine release at the beginning yeah. you know again i'm old you can't can't see my gray hairs if you just listen to this on the podcast this is uh youtube 2010 to 2013 even pre-instagram um i was doing it to keep myself sharp and i love sharing content and so I did it for, I just challenged myself, I do 300 videos, do one video every weekday for 300 weekdays. And I did that and got a following. So that felt good to have the following. And I felt very thankful and I wanted to keep providing content for them. I did write some online training manuals and books and did get plenty of revenue out of that. But the reason why I stopped doing it is because I get so much more value about serving people in person mm. and I was spreading my time too thin. So I disappeared off the YouTube about three years ago to focus more on the local stuff I'm talking about. Now this new project, the level up your gym is a reemergence of where I I'm just looking to, to, to work with and mentor 10 gym owners around the country. But I know to do that, I need the proof of concept that I know what the hell I'm talking about. So I got to get back on the internet. I got to do the podcast and I have to build authority back in the marketplace. Like back in the day, I used to write for men's health and oxygen magazines, but now I need to do the same for the, the gym space. And I, the long-term vision is more concrete now where I do want to work with people and I do want to be able to walk into their gyms and see how they're doing and help them out and help them grow uh, on that level. Now to pivot, I'm doing something very similar in my local market for the same reason. Okay. So now to talk about gym strategies, we have our local gym podcast that's launching 
And we partnered up with a lot of local businesses where I sit around and interview them and talk about health and wellness in the community. And we provide the platform for them um, to, to be able to speak. So on that level, it's building authority in the community. For this one, it's building authority in the marketplace for, for gym owners. Uh, but it is a tactic that I would recommend looking into, whether it's YouTube videos, whether it's Instagram, whether it's Facebook, whether it's podcasts, whatever you're most comfortable with, you have to show people you know what you're talking about. Hmm. I've just been having kind of a, a love-hate relationship with things, thinking about the amount of time applied often with people doing things and what's the point in people making videos for a few likes from somebody in Australia when they live in the UK and it's not going to bring them a single pound in their pocket. Like what, there's a lot of time that people spend on stuff that doesn't ever generate any business in the long run, but just it's, it's an ongoing dilemma that I have. This is the ironic part. And I mentioned it earlier where people that you think would be making millions are really losing mm. money or breaking even at their businesses because they, they, they spend a lot of time on that stuff is that some of the most successful people, many of the most successful people, I would dare say the majority of successful people are not going to be on those platforms. Yeah. There's going to be a, a handful of a very loud few that do very well. And that's not to talk down to them, but it, it creates an unrealistic um, perception in people's mind. Like that, that is a necessary thing to get on and talk about how much success you have to have success. The, my closest mentor is a guy that owns a computer company and he'll be on a podcast here shortly. I don't think he knows how to uh, post a video on YouTube. Doesn't care to <clears throat> yet. Yeah. He's built, built multiple companies, sold multiple companies. And it's probably more people that you know like that than actually make money. On. There's probably more people in your town that you know that make money that way than in all of the Instagram universe. Yeah. So my my final question was, it, well, it's a bit of an old one. I was going to ask, how do you sleep at night? So you have multiple facilities and each of those has multiple jobs and things going on at one time. And as you know, obviously in the fitness industry, the hours are not particularly sociable sometimes. So I, I mean, I have things going on in my head and I don't have three gyms to, to manage and people to manage and payroll to manage and things like that. So what's been your biggest way of managing time and then also unwinding and making sure that you're not kind of working till midnight every night and up again at four. Yes. Well, I sleep at night cause I'm exhausted, but <laughs> I guess what it's come around more, more recently. It took a while to figure this out is that I wrote down every position that I want filled in my ideal business. So that includes sales and marketing trainer, head coach mm -hmm. operations. And I put the job description underneath them. It was very clear in those job descriptions because a lot of times gym owners will go hire someone say, Hey, I need help. And they hire someone. They're like, well, this person's not a good, but really the gym owner never told them what to do. Mm. So we, and in those roles, almost all those roles were me. I had to write my name in all those roles because I was, I was doing them all. And then slowly I hired for people who had those as strengths and I was able to reduce the roles and they were very clear on what needed to be done in those boxes. So clarity and accountability has been huge. On the creative side, I have this that sits right here on my desk. I wasn't planning on showing it, but this is uh, my thousand idea project. Every day I write down three ideas for synergy, three ideas for level up like we're doing now, and three ideas for my family until I get up to a thousand ideas. Once those three ideas are down and out of my brain, I no longer think about them until the next day. So I can check that box is done and then it provides me some mental space to be able to um, focus on what's important for me, which are my three kids, my wife, the, and being able to teach and mentor others. And so those jobs are daily jobs to be completed on that day or they're just long-term? Oh, it's who's in charge of that responsibility. So I, I don't have it right in front of me, but we have the CEO, which is still me. Yeah. It's a it's called an organization chart if you're able to Google it. And then below that, we'll have the person who's in charge of marketing and sales, which is also me. Then the person who's in charge of operations, which is someone named Krista, who does a great job in the job role. So every week she's in charge of our operations, making sure the buildings are, are on point, making sure all our customer service is done. That's all her role. The next one's the head coach role, which is Brian, one of our staff members who's been with mm. us for four or five years. He's in charge of the service on the gym floor. He meets with every staff member every 90 days and evaluates them. He does a staff meeting every week and one in person, one, uh, one person hour professional development with them each month. And he's in charge of all of that. So all I do is I check in with Krista. I'll check in with Brian. 
And those are the only two that I need to help accountable. And then they need to keep the, the staff and the facilities and everything else in the line. They do an excellent job at it because of, I think, the clarity that they were given. And here's what we need to do. And they, they participated in creating those job roles. They've done a good job with them. So it's a slow, a slow delegation progress process, I guess, that was everything was you. And then bit by bit, you've handed off chunks to people to specialize in bit by bit as the, as the business grew. Exactly. So initially it was all you. Yeah. And then you hire a trainer Mm -hmm. and then that person will probably stay with you a year or two and then leave unless you have a role for them to elevate themselves to. So then we had assistant coach and head trainer and in order to provide space for them to be able to elevate themselves to those roles, I needed to back off and focus on something else in the business that was more unique to my skill set, the marketing and sales. So you can hire for your, for your weaknesses, but you also need to hire for what's available in the marketplace and what people are passionate about. So we didn't hire our, our first non-trainer employee for about eight years. Okay. It was just trainers and head coach, uh, tra- head coach and then trainers and myself. Um, we didn't even get customer service or administrator. A lot of gym owners jump on that when really they're just trying to have someone else do the job that they're not good at instead of learning that role first and then yeah. hiring it so you can hold that person accountable. If that makes sense. I cut you off. What was your question? Uh, well, no, I was just, just going to ask about the pad with the, the three ideas, the thousand ideas. So are yeah. these tasks that you come up with each day and have to be completed that day or are they long term? Oh no, these are just, just ideas. So for synergy, a couple were, uh, we tried to do a kid's event for Halloween. So one of them was drive through Halloween because we couldn't do trunk or treat. We couldn't do trick or treat really because of COVID, but drive through restaurants were always open. So we said, Hey, let's have, invite our members over. We'll get a couple people to de- they'll dress up. You just drive through the line. We'll throw some candy at your car. We thought it was going to be a small event. I thought, oh, God, we must have had 200 cars, mostly community members just rolling through because they, it was a need in our area and part of health is mental health and people were panicking about what they can do for their kids and we solved yeah. that problem for them so drive through halloween was one um better member shout outs we need to credit our members more often so i needed to get on the staff about that um doing a hard challenge group that we a lot of our challenges at our gym are just kind of easy ones uh so we need to to speak to everyone um mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I got my level up ones the podcast was on there. I mean, this has been a couple of months. We launched it. We're doing it now. Uh 30 day packet. We're considering, you know, sharing what I'm going to do for the next 30 days with other gym owners and make it part of the program. And, um, down to the hashy family one, which is our weekly family meeting, which we did one was sleep on the roof. Our kids asked if they can see the stars better. So we're like, yeah, we can sleep on the barn roof, get them all loaded up and just write down ideas that we want to do there. So so whatever comes to mind, put it down on the paper and then maybe one out of every 10 is a decent idea. Good. Then you go back and look at it at the end of the year and you have a massive to-do list that you've... Yeah, my, to, you my to-do with. list is just a post-it note. I only okay. use post-it notes for to-do lists because if it's greater than a post-it note, I shouldn't be doing it that day. It's just the bigger task that I need to do, um, which is I only have one more thing to do today. I got to email out the level up your gym people that I'm going to do a special webinar tonight on teaching them how to do holiday sales. Other than that, the to-do list is done. Sounds like a good day. Yeah, (laughs) that's right. Well, that was it. That was all the questions I kind of had. They were the, I know you you already answered quite a lot of the stuff in your previous podcast. So I had a long list and it's gone down and down as I've listened to more and more. So that was what was left to ask. Well, that's awesome. We sit tight. I'm going to wrap up the podcast then for the listeners with a, a couple of tips and, and Michael stay on because I want to reemphasize you have my email and I'll be able, happy to help you out whenever, but I want to thank you for coming on the show. It's been a long time since we talked and following these years and seeing our progress has been um, really humbling for a lot of people who have, have followed the YouTube videos for so long and still reach out and I still have questions and I'm still able to help out. Uh, so I'm very happy to have you on and for the level up your gym listeners, you can always get our free video series at levelupyourgym.com. It's like a gym business masterclass to your inbox in three to five minutes, minute videos every morning. That should be on your to-do list. That should be on your post-it card to go uh, listen to those because it's a complimentary service. And once I find those 10 people to mentor, I'm probably not going to shoot as many of those videos because I'll be reaching my goals already. So now's the time to grab them while they're still available. And if you've enjoyed the podcast today, please swing by your favorite Uh, podcast platform and give us a review.
Thank you everyone for listening. And thank you, Michael, for being here. Thanks for having me.